Father Enda McDonough has been described as one of the more influential and liberal theologians in the Catholic Church. He was a former Maynooth University professor of moral theology and was for many decades involved in intellectual discussions on the Catholic Church's direction. He was also official chaplain to former President Mary Robinson during her presidency. In a moment, I'll speak with her about the man she called a friend. But first, in May 2009, Father Enda McDonough was a studio panellist on the Marion Finucane show on RT Radio 1. He'd been invited to share his views on the newly published Ryan Report into the abuse of children in institutions run by a range of religious congregations. The only hope of redemption, I think, for the likes of me and the official church is if we are prepared to put up our hand and say, look, we it isn't just that we got it wrong. That might suggest we made misjudgments. We did wrong either directly in the form of abuse or indirectly in terms of cover up or ignoring or not wanting to know. So I believe that we all will never, will never be able, in my view, to present ourselves as Christians in public until we are able to undertake that complete humiliation that will show us for the sinners we are. Father Enda McDonough speaking on the Marion Fanukan Show following the publication of the Ryan Report in May 2009. Well, joining me now from her home is former President Mary Robinson. You're welcome to the programme. Firstly, can I ask you about your memories of Father McDonough? It's almost impossible to describe how rich an experience it was to know Enda McDonough, or indeed to describe him in a way that conveys this. He was intellectual, but didn't come across as one. He was a rounded man who loved all sport and had a great sense of humor and a sense of fun. He was deeply spiritual, but very approachable to those who questioned their faith or indeed had no religious belief. John Horgan did us two favors. He wrote a wonderful and quite funny piece celebrating Ender for his 90th birthday uh, last June, which all his many friends enjoyed. And he did an obituary in the Irish Times, which described Enda as a, a theologian and scholar with a towering intellect. But I want, to, if I may, to read from a paragraph of it, um, which I think really captures Enda. His good humoured, easygoing manner embodied an ironic, self-deprecating humility, which no flattery could puncture. But it also concealed a towering intellectual presence, combined with a deeply rooted sense of service to others, which made an ineradicable impression on all who knew him. And I was lucky enough to know Enda for all of my adult life. And he was often full of surprises. Uh, when Pope Benedict retired as Pope, uh, Enda mentioned around our kitchen table that he had studied in Germany with both Ratzinger, Pope Benedict, and Hans Kung. And then he said that he preferred the theology of Hans Kung, but the company of Ratzinger. <laughs> that was typical Enda. And I remember, you know, as High Commissioner, uh, again, being down in our place in Mayo, we both loved Mayo, and I was delighted he could uh, take over a gate lodge um, to our home in Mayo. Uh, and he often came and had lunches or suppers, meals with us. And I was, uh, aware fully now as High Commissioner of just how serious the AIDS issue was um, in about, you know, 1998, 99. And he talked about the work he had been doing um, in Zimbabwe and in Malawi, and I think elsewhere, at a very early stage of the AIDS crisis when nobody quite knew what it was, except that it was deadly. And even in his retirement from Maynooth, um, you know, in, in, certainly in his 70s, um, he would go each summer and do what he called a locum for a priest friend of his um, who served a largely gay uh, community. And, you know, th that, that, uh, that was how incredibly open he was to those who were marginalized, to those who were, you know, who needed uh, the kind of generous support that he could give. And I know that countless families are mourning him in, in Ireland and elsewhere because he was there to marry them, he baptized their children, or he was there to say a requiem mass um, for a close relation. And now 
we're in COVID times and it's very difficult to mourn him. I, I feel very privileged. I've been asked to go to the uh, a, a prayer service the day before the funeral, the night before the funeral, um, where uh, it will be in the chapel in, in Maynooth where his body will repose. And that, that will help me a little. But I know there are many who feel it's so hard to mourn in the time of COVID. He served as official chaplain to you during your presidency. And I'm just thinking about, you've already described the idea of the kitchen table debates. Were there rules of engagement for the two of you when you got into a good theological discussion, which I'm sure did happen? Not really in the sense that, um, uh, first of all, I quickly wanted, uh, when I learned that the uh, president would have a chaplain, I quickly wanted to ensure that I had Enda and uh, I remember a funny story that happened about a month later, he got what he thought was a bill, but in fact, it was a small check from the government, <laughs> the services, and we both laughed about that. We did have lots of discussions. I mean, for me, it is just so wonderful to be able to talk to him about everything and, 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 and some theological discussions. We both shared a great interest in law and morality and the role of the state in that, and he very much had supported my early efforts on family planning. And we were on a constitutional committee together in the late 60s, uh, you know, reform of the constitution to open it up and remove the ban on divorce, for example. And he was in favour of that. He also would have had a, an influence in the areas of faiths coming together a, and also the idea of, of peace would have been one of his drivers. Very, very much so. We, we talked a lot about Northern Ireland. He was so engaged. Uh, he you know, was part of the Irish Association. I think he was president of for the years with Barbara Fitzgerald. Um, you know, he was very, uh, he was such a rounded man. Uh, you know, uh, he, he was engaged in almost in everything that mattered. And yet he wore it so lightly and from, with that kind of humour that helped. Uh, but he was very, very engaged in peace in Northern Ireland, just quietly behind the scenes. A lot of people talk about the influence of good and great teachers. What do you think is the influence he's left behind him? I think he was obviously a great teacher because I know people who told me much later that they were students of something else in Maynooth, but actually sat in on his theology lessons because he was such a wonderful teacher. And you know, I think that's just part of that personality that it's hard to do justice to. Uh, his voice, uh, his way of speaking, his openness, his humour, his approachability, his leaning to give you somehow the courage to say what you wanted to say, you know, to everybody that, that he encountered, in particular those who needed uh, that kind of support uh, to, to feel justified in themselves somehow. A man of great courage man of great courage. Uh, he, he knew he would never become a bishop because he had taken uh, the stands that he took. He was involved um, in a, a, a quite a radical journal uh, quite late on, um, well, when I was president, uh, um, KJA, and unfortunately, uh, it, 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 it didn't last. Um, it, it had to go under. But I remember launching uh, a version of it in the KJA fields in Mayo. And we had to run for our lives afterwards because of the midges. We were, you know, outside up on the hill. And I remember running down the steps to the official car and beetling back to our home um, to get away from those Mayo midges. So remembered in both ways, both as a cleric and also as a man, uh, your, your final memories then of Father Enda McDonough. His generosity and openness to young people. I saw that not only with my own children who, you know, really loved him in a way, and nephews and nieces, they've all been sending me messages. Uh, how, how can you describe somebody who evokes such love and everybody knew him? And, and it upsets you to, in, in that way. You'll miss him. I miss him terribly, yes. I've missed him for the last months, as I know Barbara Fitzgerald has, um, being able to even go and see him in the nursing home and now not being able to say goodbye. It's hard. Gavon uh, Vichyche uh, i may he rest in peace. Um, he, he actually, in later years, was ready to go. He would lost a number of priest friends in particular, close friends, and he you know, was quite lonely, I think, in his last year or two in Maynooth when we visited him there and uh, I, he was ready to go.
to his to his to his God. His faith sustaining him. Oh, absolutely. Eric Robinson, thank you for joining us on the programme this evening. Thank you. An edition in which we hear an archives-based self-portrait of the theologian Dr. Enda McDonough, who died this past week, aged 90. This morning, his vocation... My kind of emotional and, you know, imaginative uh, drive lay with making life better for the people I knew. As the archives reveal, he had a very wide range of interests. This from a rare TV documentary on the responsibilities of a farmer selling an animal at a fair. If the buyer was looking for a milk cow, hmm. and in fact this cow gave little or no milk or had some disease of the udder or something, then I think the seller would obviously have an obligation to admit this. His controversial, some even thought heretical opposition to the Catholic Church's encyclical on contraception. The then Archbishop of Cashel, on his way out of the meeting, was asked by one of the staff, did you appoint your Mackey? And he said, no, but we didn't fire McDonough. His early championing of homosexual law reform. You know, I thought about it and I even prayed about it and I said to myself, uh, you know, what would Jesus do in these circumstances? And Conway replied, good God, you didn't, he said. <laughs> so we both laughed. From an interview with Olivia O'Leary, we'll hear more of that later. President Michael D. Higgins led the tributes to Dr. McDonough when his death was announced earlier this week. President Higgins emphasised Andrew McDonough's courage, his commitment to ecumenism, and the work that might bring an enabling peace on our island and in our relationship with others. Dr. McDonough's was the generous spirit that so many turned to again and again on public campaigns when denunciations were so often more forthcoming than support. Be it in relation to the ending of apartheid, women's rights, travellers' rights, he was always there to listen and support. More of the security of my childhood allowed me to, to do things because I thought they would be interesting and uh, useful and different. And that took me on through life in, 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 a, in a relatively enriching way. From an interview with Olivia O'Leary in January 2000. Enda McDonough was born in Beckon in County Mayo in 1930. Well, there were three of us, uh, three boys. My mother lost two children at birth and think that affected her a bit. But uh, by comparison with our neighbours, in a way, we were, we were relatively well off because both my parents were teachers and we lived in a very poor part of Mayo. It wasn't so much that we didn't, we didn't lack for the basics, but uh, that I, I was a kind of a happy uh, child, really, and I suppose I was a bright child in some respects and got a lot of encouragement from people. And uh, I look back on that and on my boarding school days um, with uh, a lot of uh, um, joy, really, although many of my companions in boarding school and best friends wouldn't have seen it in quite the same terms. You know. Well, I, I gather it was a fairly political household. Your father was involved in politics. That's right. Locally. He was, yes, he was, he was heavily involved in, in Fianna Foyle. He was chairman of the uh, the constituency party in as it was in south mayo and then became east mayo and there were politicians in and out of the house all the time and we were very politically conscious and i was very interested uh, partly because of that and partly because i saw politics as very significant in the development of the community in enabling people to have better lives. And I was conscious of the need to have people to have better lives because as I've um, told many people before in my primary school, there were about 23 or 24 boys in my final year class, the primary cert class as it was called, and two of us made their living in Ireland. And that, uh, you know, fired me a bit in relation to the importance of politics in ensuring that people could grow and develop in their homeland if they wished to. So how and why did he decide to become a priest? I was a great reader, but people at the same time thought my, my strength was in mathematics. But my, my kind of emotional and... Um, you know, imaginative uh, drive lay with making life better 
for the people I knew. And at first I thought that lay primarily in politics. And then as I grew a bit older, I thought it lay primarily with becoming a priest and becoming that kind of pastoral community leader who could give them a kind of lift as well as opening them up to something that politics couldn't open them up to. You know, a dimension of life that I thought uh, would be, as we, we would say, eternally enriching for them. But it was uh, uh, some ideal of service. Andrew McDonough was fortunate that his career as a theologian coincided with an historic period in the Church's history. The Second Vatican Council opened in October 1962. Much is being made of differences of opinion that are appearing on various questions. And there was a babble of opinion as to how the Church would change. Or wouldn't. We shall no doubt have sharply contrasting proposals coming up at every stage in our discussions. There was this wide cleavage of opinion on how Catholic truth regarding the revelation of God should be presented to our own people and to those outside the church. Looking back at the Vatican Council 50 years later, Enda McDonough talked on RTE's The God Slot. The Sunday Mass suddenly became to you in English. You know, people were encouraged and did participate in prayers of the faithful, eventually in Eucharistic ministers and so on. All that was quite extraordinary uh, it, to people like me who um, had been saying Mass in Latin for more than fi for about 15 years. My uh, granny was distraught. She couldn't say her rosary anymore. <laughs> yes, that was the other thing, you know, that, that the rosary went by the way. And, you know, and the, Cushing had a line about it that it was great, he said. But on the other hand, Cardinal Cushing of Boston, he said, and I understand, he said, that the men who kneel at the back of the church, he said, they began to look at leaflets and take more uh, interest. But after a while, they got kind of bored too and went back to picking their noses. So <laughs> it wasn't transformative in terms of the heart or involvement for everybody, naturally. But it was a very significant. Uh, but it didn't somehow then go beyond that. I, I think in, in many ways it did, you know, but... It, it didn't seem to me to issue into, on the one hand, any deeper sense of prayer for most of us, you know, or on the other hand, for any deeper sense of mission. One of the nine, there were nice things, though. For instance, it was very small but and very simple, and that was the changing of the sacrament of anointing, which was really a kind of getting you ready for death sacrament, to the sacrament of healing which, you know, applied at a whole range of levels for people. And, you know, you didn't have to be, as it were, terminally ill to receive the sacrament of healing. Now, the sacrament of healing was also, of course, part of the whole healing mission of the church. Interestingly, while that sacrament <laughs> increased in numbers and in depth, I think, the sacrament of confession about which we have been talking declined spectacularly. Once you got in English the penitential rite in the Mass. People didn't see the same kind of need for private confession because the whole Mass itself was a kind of a healing and reconciling event and they didn't see the need for that. One good thing that did happen as well, the, that the Mass became not so much the recall or representation of the death of Christ, but it included the resurrection and was a community event. On that program, he also made the point that labels were too superficially used in commentary on the Vatican Council. Terms such as... L liberals or progressives and conservatives. Such easy terms obscure the complexity of the changes wrought by the Council. The developments in the Church itself that are sometimes seen as the most radical were based on what was called by various theologians and by the Pope himself the resourcement, returning to the very earliest 
uh, roots of the church uh, in in biblical terms, in in tradition, uh, historical tradition terms, and so on. So that the liturgical renewal, for example, began with very conservative people going back to the early history and discovering what we then took into the community meal, the, the use of the vernacular, all these things that came in, dropping many of the accretions and additions and so on. And this applied more widely so that the two kind of ideas that came out of the John the 23rd vision of going back to the sources, that's a very conservative and properly conservative because you have to return both to the Jewish people and to Jesus Christ in order to be true or authentic. On the other hand, you have to confront the modern world. And that was the adjournment of it. Now, I think how people mix these is part of, what, of the division we have. But the second problem is who has the power? And it seems to me that one of the great weaknesses of the contemporary church is that it's still seen in many ways as a power game by the people who have allegedly the power in the name of Christ and by the gift of the Holy Spirit and so on. But that power is too easily a political, worldly power and is not the kind of service ministry that Jesus embodied and that the saints and all the best people in the church. Enda McDonough had been a reader as a young boy, had scholarly habits, had been appointed professor of moral theology in Maynooth at the age of 28. This was a pathway to what were thought of as higher things at that time, invariably a pathway to becoming a bishop or archbishop. But as he explains here, his appointment as professor was fortuitous. Because William Conway became auxiliary bishop of Armagh, and uh, I was the sort of um, bright young man available, apparently. So uh, those days you didn't apply out of yourself. I was told by my bishop to apply, so I applied. And I was interviewed by some of the greats like Michael John Brown and uh, Cardinal Dalton and so on, and, and I was appointed. I think they knew very little about me except that I had a good record. <laughs> Why do you think they wouldn't have appointed you if they did know? <laughs> well, if the mind have appointed me five years later, I was <laughs> Dr. McDonough quickly won a reputation as a thinker, as a writer, author, and so effective as a broadcaster that there were early signs of the emergence of the public intellectual we later knew. The most controversial issue of that period was the Church's views on contraception. On religious programs, the contraception issue morphed very rapidly from is it a sin to is it a crime to is it a civil right. That rapid change was initiated by the scientific breakthrough of the contraceptive pill and later the papal encyclical Humanae Vitae. But no, I was not at all happy about Humanae Vitae. And I had written uh, critically beforehand of the need for change. And when the uh, in, uh, encyclical was issued, uh, a number of European theologians were invited to uh, a meeting in Amsterdam to consider a response to it and an alternative to it. So we drew up a, a response which was respectful, but then criticised the kind of argumentation and offered a kind of alternative. This was in contradiction to the position being adopted by the Irish bishops. There was no uh, reaction from the bishops as a whole at the time that I was aware of. But shortly afterwards, there was an appointment coming up in theology in Maynooth, and a very outstanding theologian called James Mackey was um, a candidate and Mackey had signed a similar document in America just before that, which had been widely publicized. And according to the story, um, the then Archbishop of Cashel, Archbishop of Morris, on his way out of the meeting, was asked by one of the staff, did you appoint Jim Mackey? And he said, no, but we didn't fire McDonough. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that, that was a kind of trade-off. Now, that's the story. With me in the studio is Father Enda McDonough, Professor of Moral Theology in Maynooth. This from the Ryark television documentary. The young professor of moral theology was being questioned on the morality to be expected on fair day. 
This was an era when animals were still traded on the streets of country towns. Father McDonough, when I was a student, we used to learn about caveat emptor, that if a man makes a bad buy, it's his own fault. How true do you think that is of business at a fair? Well, caveat emptor is a kind of rule of thumb which describes a general attitude which operates in business, and particularly in business at a fair. For instance, if the buyer was looking for a milk cow, hmm. and in fact this cow gave little or no milk or had some disease of the udder or something which made it entirely unsuitable, well then, if this wasn't apparent from the cow herself, then I think the seller would obviously have an obligation to admit this. And Rark also investigated the issue of pig smuggling across the Irish border. Well, accepting perhaps that there should be no border, that Ireland is 32 counties, doesn't immediately relieve you of the problem raised by smuggling. Um, first of all, the custom duties that are connected at the border, that um, are intended for one community or other. Yeah. It's not a question of who is the legal government of Northern Ireland yes. or which government we should recognize, but that there are people there, a community there, mm -hmm. which has needs, whose needs are supplied by the taxation raised. And yes. of course, it wouldn't apply at all to goods coming into the Republic, yes. to evading the custom duties of the Republic. It, to my mind, the argument is irrelevant. And there were more serious issues too, like divorce and homosexuality. Well, I had spoken for a long time, going way back, on the need to separate the church view of divorce and the state view of divorce. Uh, I would be of the view that, you know, there is a permanent call or commitment in marriage, but in, in religious terms, in sacramental terms, but I didn't see that it was a matter for the church to insist on that within state law. I made a similar point about homosexuality, that the laws should be changed. Now, what was interesting about that was I knew very little about it, uh, the whole situation of homosexuality in Dublin, until I was approached by two young men from the Legion of Mary who told me that they had this problem of young men gathering around the O'Connell Street gents and various places like that. And, you know, who were, they felt it wasn't fair and they were, they had hired a room from CIE building in order so that they could meet and have tea and chat together anyway. And now, then now they didn't know what to do and somebody suggested that they, that they meet me. So uh, I used to meet them and then uh, the first major conference, this is about 1972, on homosexuality was being held in Dublin. And no hotel in Dublin would give them uh, premises on which to hold their conference, on public conference on homosexuality. So I suggested that we try Trinity College, and Trinity provided the thing. And I spoke at it and said that the laws should be changed. These were gay men? These were all gay men. Yeah. There was high, I, I don't think there was a single gay woman, a, a yeah. lesbian woman in, involved. But it... it the, <laughs> The conference turned into a little bit of a circus because a number of very camp gay people came over from England, you know, and made the whole thing amusing in a way, but very shocking for some people. It got loads of publicity, and I got uh, an awful lot of uh, um, letters from bishops and priests objecting to this, and um, Archbishop Conway, with F Cardinal Conway, for whom I had a great regard, came up at a bishop's meeting, he said he would deal with it. So he came to talk to me and he said, wasn't I very foolish to, uh, um, to kind of go along to this? Didn't I know the kind of reaction? And I knew he was being kind and also that he wasn't really going to do anything about it. But I couldn't resist being a bit mischievous and I said to him, I said to him, well, you know, uh, Cardinal, you know, I thought about it and I even prayed about it and I said to myself, uh, you know, what would Jesus do in these circumstances? And Conway replied, good God, you didn't, he said. <laughs> so we both laughed, and that was. But I'd say from the point of view of any kind of, uh, you know, career terms, n not that I had any particular interest in it, but that was definitely the end. Humana vitae plus homosexuality was enough to... <laughs> To, uh, you were never uh, going to be a bishop after never that. Never going to be a bishop. And, and that was a great relief, because once you knew you were never going to be a bishop or never going to be in line for being a bishop, well, to, to say what you take earlier, the risks weren't really risks anymore. <laughs> yeah.
Elsewhere in the archives, Enda McDonough paid this tribute to the Trinity political scientist, broadcaster and Labour politician, David Thornley, when he died at 42. So he was at that time active, involved in, as it were, an educational process of the wider public and a learning process for himself, which involved this development of his thinking both as a Catholic and as a socialist. His contribution there, I think, is still, as it were, undeveloped. In my view, after that period, politics and the theoretical grounding of politics changed somewhat again. This was partly due, undoubtedly, to the development of the Northern Troubles, partly due to the losing out at the time of uh, the Just Society concept promoted by Declan Costa, which interested and even excited David at the time. And I think partly due then to, in a sense, his own shift of interest in the later stages of his life, so that he has left some unfinished business there, I think, for the rest of us, that Irish um, thinkers and Catholics and politicians will still have to face. Can you explore the relationship between Catholicism and socialism, can you develop a proper understanding between them and generate a, a political ideal and a political theory and a political movement that will capture uh, the mass of the Irish people for a genuine socialism. Meanwhile, Maynooth itself was changing, with vocations fading, dwindling. It was admitting lay students and women. Many of us thought for quite some time that we'd had too many priests in Ireland and that in fact, as Liam Ryan put it, it wasn't the decline that was the surprise but the huge rise in the number of occasions in the 30s and 40s and 50s. He also thought that of those being recruited to the priesthood there were fewer radicals, dissenters, sceptics. Because the numbers were fewer, we were getting fewer very good people if you were highly intelligent people, but even proportionately, uh, we were getting fewer of the of, of of the better people. And now you could argue that, and uh, in my diocese in the thirties and forties, you got the brightest and the best who did doctorates and ended up very frustrated men in country parishes. You know, so that. It isn't necessarily the, you know, the, the best way to go. No, but but still, but still, you weren't getting the risk takers, were you? You weren't. No, no. You were, that, that was another side of it. Uh, uh, you were getting more conformist people in many ways, you know. Does that worry you? Oh, yes. I, I think there is, there is no future for a church that doesn't take risks. I'm struggling with the book for the last couple of years called The Risk of God. And it's uh, about all of us being afraid of the risk of God. But I believe that that's part of the trouble with church leaders. They're afraid to risk God, a God that they can control, domesticate, turn into, you know, a, a kind of symbol of what they want for people and the society and let loose this subversive God of Jesus Christ, which could turn us all upside down if we were open to it. Reverend Dr. Enda McDonough, who died this past week, aged 90. Some further themes from the McDonough archives next Sunday morning. The shame of the child abuse revelations in the church. But I want to, in a sense, indict the whole church. The impact of all of this on innocent priests. When they go about in their clerical dress and so on and may be um, taunted or... Uh, you know, cursed or uh, thrown out of houses. And looking back, the loneliness of living the priestly life. Now, many of us would have lay friends with whom we could open up more easily. And some of these would be women friends. And because they would, they would have ways maybe that you weren't conscious of, of, of encouraging you and, and letting you open out and so on in ways that um, uh, maybe you never intended to, but, but that, that it came out and that it often proved to, to, to be healing.